Well, so we're glad that you're here. Welcome to this place. Please stand with us as we worship together and we begin by giving thanks to our God. Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones And I try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond Just when I ran You ain't welcome here. From night to hour, walk the streets of gold. I sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. Oh, oh, oh. Pick me up, you turn me around. Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. with us. Tell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Tell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Come on. Tell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Oh, I am free. Tell lost another one. Till I want streets to go, I sing of how you see my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart. time 
coming. You know what I'm going to say, right? Her first or second time coming, it doesn't look like it, but she was significantly shorter than me then. And she was, it was years ago, and we were teaching on the temple and the Holy of Holies and being separated. And we were teaching about in Exodus, when you came to church, you talked to the priest, and then the priest had to go behind the curtain, and you couldn't just directly talk to God. And so I said at the end, does, does everybody remember? Where's the Holy of Holies? And Briley raised her hand, and she said, I know the Holy of Holies. It's Holy Moly! And, <laughs> and it's one of my favorite stories ever. <laughs> and it just brought me so So every time I think of the Holy of Holies, I think, Holy Moly! And Briley. And what a great memory that is today to learn about, um, because... Today, she is no longer just interacting with the Holy Spirit. She's going to have the Holy Spirit living in her. So instead of being behind a curtain, <laughs> praise God, instead of being behind a curtain and instead of being in the ark and locked away, God is going to live in you and going to help you make decisions. And just like Mark's going to preach about today, you just submit to his will and he'll give you peace and he'll help you make the right decision every time. And I am so excited that I get to be here to watch that with you. And um, so I'm going to have you repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him as my Lord. As my Lord and Savior. And Savior. Because of your repentance and your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're going to go this way. I want to be everything that God has created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, God, do whatever it takes to, to get things out of my life that don't need to be there. Mold me into the image of your son so that I can be your masterpiece. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, you just said the prayer, so here I am. That's how it works. Oh, okay, okay. Um, if you're God, then make it snow in here. You know, if I made it snow in here, it'd get kind of yucky, and I really don't want to do that. See, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. Yes, I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. If you're God, what does Lamentations 15, 9 say? Lamentations is a very short book. It only has five chapters. Why is it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? You know what? I'm not so much into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. I gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <laughs> yep, I do that. Don't I? Get it again. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. okay. All right. Hey, yeah. um, what's this about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Here we go. Step okay. right up. Here we go. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. How do you know what to chisel and what to leave? I take out all the things in your life that aren't out of me, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of that, could you chisel right in here? I just can't get rid of it. I mean, the other went away, but this, I mean, I've tried exercising, I've watched what I ate, I even did Pilates for a while, that was awkward. But if you could chisel, all I mean, right. Can I talk or can I chisel, talk, chisel, talk, chisel, No, talk, no, no, chisel. no, chisel. All right, most of my children just like to talk. Not me, bring on the chisel. Here we go. All right, you have a lot of anger. Ow. Some pride. Ow. Compare yourself to others instead of me. Ow! You're lazy, <clears throat> but you pretend like you're really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? No, okay, <laughs> time out. <laughs> I do not have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust? No, I can do it anytime I want. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Um, maybe, maybe we can take a little time out. I mean, I think I'm doing pretty good. You are doing good, but when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me! Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and others need to see my son. Here we go. Okay, hold on, hold on. Um, don't take this the wrong way. It's just that when I start looking more like your son, um, people get uncomfortable around me, you know? I mean, even my friends at church, they're all like, oh, you're holier than thou. Why would you do that, you know? I mean, so what you're doing right now is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. I did not say that. That's what you meant. Yes, it is. 
it's hard to talk to you. I mean, you know everything I'm thinking. I'm just saying, you've done good work. Maybe we take a little break, a little time out, then we'll come back to right. it. What you're doing right now is so common. What you're doing right now is called control. Do you want to control things in your life, or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control. No, no, chisel. chisel. Here we go. No, can, can we chisel where I want that? It's called control. Okay. You've been holding on to this for a long time. You ready for this? I met a friend of mine at a restaurant. This has been some years ago now. Josh walked in. He took one look at me, and he said, you look more like Jesus every time I see you. Now, maybe that impresses you. Maybe it doesn't. It probably would not impress you so much if you knew why he said it. Here's a picture of me from the summer of 2012. <laughs> I had some hair going on, okay? Look, Josh said that I looked more like Jesus because every photograph that we have of Jesus, right, shows him with long hair. My guess is it was red. But anyway, if all it took to look like Jesus was long hair, every rock band from the 70s would have been full of Jesuses, right? Looking like Jesus is not about hair, it's not about robe and sandals, it's not even about looking Middle Eastern. Looking like Jesus is about our character, right? It's about, it's about humility, it's about holiness, it's about compassion. When's the last time somebody said to you, you are more like Jesus every time I see you? When's the last time they said that to me for the right reason? You know, Ken Geyer is one of my favorite authors. Gail and I have read several of his books. And we read one together years ago called Shaped by the Cross. And he talked in that book about the process that God puts us through to make us look more like Jesus. To help kind of grasp the concept, he talked about the great artist Michelangelo. Michelangelo Buonarroti Simone, I don't know, that's his name. A name like that, you figure he's got to be an Italian artist or in the mafia. But Michelangelo was born in 1475 in Tuscany, Italy. He became, along with Leonardo da Vinci, the, great, the creative force behind the Italian Renaissance. Michelangelo was the chief architect for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. I believe it's still the largest church building in the world. He was a painter, he was a sculptor, a poet. He painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I painted the ceiling in our bathroom, but I don't have a picture of that, okay? Michelangelo may have been the greatest artist of all time. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that all men are created equal, and then I read about a guy like Michelangelo, you start to wonder. I mean, he, he could do so much. He was amazing. I think I could have taken him in basketball. That, that's all, you know, that kind of comes to mind. But, but he's just unbelievable. But, but more than a great artist, he was a devout believer in God. He wrote in a letter to his nephew, I work out of love for God, and I put all my hope in him. Michelangelo often spent months in Carrera, Italy, where the marble for his statues was quarried. He would choose the marble that he wanted. They would carve it out of the stone and break it loose, you know, from a rock ledge. They would transport it on rollers down to a ship. They would load it up, send it to his studio in Rome where he would labor over it days, weeks, months, even years. He explained that the figures that he envisioned, now don't miss this, this is really important. The figures that he sculpted were trapped inside the stone, and it was his job to chip away everything that was not part of them. He, he once said, I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved until I set him free. When Michelangelo was only 23 years old, I mean, think about that, 23 years old, he was commissioned to sculpt the Pieta, his greatest work, one of the greatest sculptures, if not the greatest sculpture in the world. We talked about the Pieta back at Easter time. Our family got to see it in Rome back in 2003. It is just unbelievable. The Pope gave Michelangelo one year to complete the statue, and that's exactly what he did. Hardly taking time to eat or sleep, 
He spent 12 months with this piece of stone, carving it into this incredible statue. When he was finished, he chiseled his name onto Mary's sash. It's the only one of his statues that he ever signed. One of his contemporaries, Giorgio Vasari, wrote this concerning the Pieta. It would be impossible for any craftsman or sculptor, no matter how brilliant, ever to surpass the grace or design of this work. It is certainly a miracle that a formless block of stone could ever have been, listen, reduced to a perfection that nature is scarcely able to create in the flesh. I want you to let that phrase sink in, reduced to perfection. Michelangelo had to reduce the stone in order to make it perfect. And I want you to kind of tuck that thought away in the back of your mind. It's where the title of my message came from today, Reduced to Perfection. Using the example of this statue, the Pieta, Ken Geyer explained in his book that God shapes us much like a sculptor shapes a block of stone. Michelangelo removed all the marble that was not Jesus and was not Mary so that he could set free the images that he saw inside. And this is what God does with us. He chisels us. He sculpts us carefully, intentionally. He removes everything in us that's not Jesus so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. He reduces us to perfection. Mark Mobley began a series for us last Sunday. It's just a short three-week series. It's called All In. And he talked about last week being justified before God. When we are saved, God looks at us, looks at me just as if I'd never sinned. And, and he sees you that way as well, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. The offer is for those of us who surrender to Christ. Once we're saved... That begins the transformation process. Justification happens immediately. Once we repent of our sins, we declare our faith and trust in Christ. We're baptized into Christ. But the process of transformation, what the Bible calls sanctification, kind of a big fancy word, being sanctified, that happens over the rest of our lives. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the sculpting process that God puts us through to reduce us to perfection. Let me read some other verses in the New Testament that kind of speak into this. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Did you get all that? For those of us who belong to Christ, those of us who are being sanctified, we are God's masterpiece. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. The old has gone. The new has come. And all that is true because of Jesus. But like that, like that statue in the stone, Jesus in us has to be set free. I really think this is the most profound lesson that God's been teaching me over the past decade or so. That his primary purpose in my life and in your life is to chip away everything in us that's not Jesus. See, there's a big difference between being a Christian and being conformed to the image of Christ. Ken Geyer says that becoming a Christian is like when a sculptor selects a stone and he removes it from the mountain. The selection of the stone is only the beginning of the process. It's not the end. Does that make sense? The salvation or justification is only the beginning. It is not the end. God sculpts us for the rest of our lives. He chips away everything that's not Jesus in us. That's sanctification. My bottom line today kind of the key thing I want to make sure you take from all this, 
is what I feel like God's been teaching me for, for several years now. That God chips away everything in us that is not Jesus. C.S. Lewis once said it this way, that Jesus would often warn people to count the cost before they surrendered to him. And he imagined, C.S. Lewis did, imagine Jesus saying it this way, make no mistake, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, Jesus says, that's what you're in for, nothing less than that. You have free will. If you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand, I will see this job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, whatever inconceivable purification, whatever it costs me, I will never rest, Jesus says, nor will I let you rest until you're perfect, until my Father can say without reservation, he is well pleased with you as he said he was well pleased with me. This I can do, Jesus says, I will do it. I will not settle for anything less. God chips away everything in us that is not Jesus. But how does he do it? What are the tools that he uses? Not a hammer and chisel, certainly. But I think there are tools that he uses to get the job done. And one of the most obvious ones is his word. I mean, think about it. Why are preachers always hounding you to read your Bible? Because the Bible is one primary way that we become like Christ. We have to know what Jesus was, is, is like, was like, is now. If we're going to be more like him, we have to know what God wants if we're going to be able to live a life that's pleasing to him. I mean, think about it. If you had a treasure map, man, you would study it and pour over it and make sure that you knew it backwards and forwards. Why? So you could find the treasure. You could discover what the map leads to. And the same goes with seeking God through his word. We, we devote ourselves to seeking him there. If you were around here last fall, you may remember we did a study of the Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's just four short chapters. I actually memorized the book of 2 Timothy back in college, and I shared it. Uh, one Sunday morning last October when we were going through that series. I had heard somebody years ago quote the book of Philippians. It was just profound to me to kind of experience scripture that way. So I wanted to be able to do that. And I, I, I did it last week again in Colorado. But here's the deal. And this has kind of become convicting to me. It's one thing to know God's word. It's another thing to do God's will, right? I mean, I, God's just kind of been working on me recently that if I work as hard to do his will as I worked to memorize those words, I'd probably be a lot farther down the road with my faith by now. It's one thing to memorize words. It's another thing to live them out. Memorizing without applying sort of misses the point. And so I think it kind of raises the question for all of us, are we devoting ourselves to God's word, not just saying it, but living it? If God really revealed himself to us through the Bible, and and, and he does, and and if God has given us enough information that we can learn who he is and what he wants for us, and, and he did, then if we want to be like Jesus, we need to be spending time in God's word. If you're kind of new to the Bible, you pick it up, you don't know where to start, these are some recommendations that I often give to people. If you don't remember these now, I'd be glad to tell you later again. I suggest people read Luke in the New Testament. The Gospel of Luke is about the life of Christ. I usually suggest they follow that up with the book of Acts. Luke also wrote Acts. It's like the, the you know part two of his writing, and it gives a picture of the church and in the early days of the church, I recommend people read the book of James that's about how to live out our faith. And then I lead people to the book of Genesis in the Old Testament to get a sense of where it all got started. If you read those books, I think you'll get hooked and you'll want to read on from there. But the Bible is so powerful. Now, another tool that God uses to sanctify us, to kind of chip away that which is not Jesus in us, is people, other people. God, I think, puts people into our lives to kind of smooth out the rough edges. They they challenge us if we're out of line. They encourage us when we're weak. They might confront us when we're wrong. This is one of the beauties of marriage, having somebody walk through life beside us who can inspire us and help us become who we could not have been otherwise. 
You know, my wife, Gail, is, has just soft heart, gentle spirit. She's not really a hammer and chisel kind of person. You know, she's more of a, of a polishing cloth that kind of can bring out some luster on a stubborn piece of metal. And that would be, would be me. But there are other people in my life who are more confrontational. The Old Testament book of Proverbs says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And we need that kind of firm accountability in our lives from our peers. And, and I also believe we need people in our lives to look up to, people who model Christ for us. You know, it's great to read the Bible and see what Jesus is like, but when somebody steps into our lives who models Christ for us, man, that can be so powerful to help us transform. It's why we need to be spending time with people who are a little farther down the road than we are spiritually. We don't idolize them. We don't have to put them up on a pedestal, but it's good to, to be with people who, who challenge us and help us deepen in our faith. And, and friends, we can also be Jesus to the people who are kind of coming along behind us that aren't quite as far down the road as we are. We can help nurture them as well. People can have a positive influence, but I'm pretty convinced that God can even take people in our lives who are crude and immoral, and they can help us conform to the image of Christ. I mean, think about it. The best way to learn patience is to have our patience tested, right? And we all know people who push our buttons. You might be sitting next to one. I'm just saying, possibly. The best way to learn compassion is to interact with somebody who's hard to love, right? We often are motivated to have more integrity when we've been around somebody who lacks integrity. So God can use anybody in our lives to make us more like Christ. Now, another sanctification tool God uses is circumstances. Ken Geyer said that God uses the circumstances of our lives, however confusing they may be, to conform us to the image of Christ. God uses circumstances even when they don't make sense. Man, I don't know about your life, but Gail and I have faced some really confusing and messy circumstances. Now, in those times, does that mean that God has checked out somehow, that he's not there, that he's gone AWOL, he packed up and went home? Of course not. Remember Romans 8, 28, what that says? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now, I love the New International Version translation of the Bible, but I don't like how it translates that verse because it leaves a word out that I think is really important. It says, in all things, God works for good, and that's true. But I like the translations that, that say, God works all things together. For good. God's promise is that he'll work all things together for good. There's going to be good things, bad things, ugly things. God can use any of that. Even the pain and suffering in our lives can be tools, I believe, that God wants to use. Sometimes people try to read Romans 8, 28 and make it say that God makes everything good in our lives. I, I don't think so. Jesus said in this world you're going to have trouble. I think the promise is that God can take anything, good, bad, ugly, and he can work it together for good. He can bring good out of anything. I was in a debate one day with somebody who believed in the health and wealth gospel that if you have enough faith, you'll never have any problems. Now, if you had been there, you might have said it was an argument. I'll say it was a debate, okay? But this guy quoted the book of James in the New Testament. Only good and perfect gifts come down from heaven. That's what he said. But is that what James actually wrote in the New Testament? It's not. James actually said in chapter 1, verse 17, all good and perfect gifts come from heaven. He didn't say only. There's no promise that God's not going to let some hard things, some painful things, even some imperfect things come into our lives. Ken Geyer said it this way, suffering has a voice in our lives, but though it has a voice, it's not the last word. God has the last word. Think about sculpting again. A good sculptor uses a hammer and chisel, and that can be uncomfortable. We saw that discomfort in the video portrayed a little while ago. But the sculptor doesn't use a sledgehammer. God chips away everything in us that's not Jesus, but he doesn't blow us up with dynamite. As, as Michelangelo once said, the more the marble wastes, 
the more the statue grows. We are being reduced to perfection. God's sculpting, his sanctification is a lifelong process. It's not like a wave of a magic wand. We aren't just instantly transformed. It's a day in and day out, year in and year out process. Slowly and steadily being reduced to perfection. And God uses people and circumstances and, and the Bible. But that's not all. He also uses failure. Failure is a part of life, right? Right? Years ago, I read about a young man who was talking to a retired businessman, and he asked him, what's the key to success? And the guy said, right decisions. Well, yeah, but how do you make right decisions? He said, experience. How do you get experience? Wrong decisions. And there's a reality to that, that we're going to fail sometimes. It is a part of life, and we can learn and grow from our failures during his lifetime, Michelangelo attempted 44 statues. He only finished 14 of them. Why do you suppose he left so many unfinished? When I read those numbers, I thought, well, maybe he died as a young man and he had gotten a lot of things started and couldn't get them done. But I found out he lived to be 89 years old. He was no spring chicken when he died. And then I thought, maybe he had such a demanding schedule, and he was so busy, and he just couldn't get them all, all done. Maybe, maybe there were defects in the marble that he didn't see coming at first. Maybe he didn't like his own work. But for whatever reason, he only completed about one-third of the statues that he started. For some reason, for some reasons, there was failure there. It's a part of life. Sometimes when I mess up, I get frustrated. Uh, Gail will say to me, welcome to the human race. I'm not sure how comforting that is, but you know what? There's a truth to it, right? And we're all in this together. Failure is a part of life. I'm kind of convinced that if you never fail in anything, you're not trying anything very big. If you never, ever fail, you're not trying anything that's big enough. And I believe if you never fail, you're robbing yourself of the opportunities to learn and grow, to stretch to lean into and depend upon God like never before. But listen, sometimes, sometimes failure is, is not about a, a poor business decision or a, a missed free throw, a bad test score, forgetting the lyrics to the national anthem in front of thousands of people. Sometimes failure comes from our sinful disobedience. It's not clumsiness, it's rebellion against God. <laughs> Rick Steadman is a preacher in California and I got to hear him speak a while back. He, his church takes communion every Sunday like we do. And he said a woman came up to him one day. She was kind of new to the church. And she asked why they take communion so often. And Rick said, I was going to say because Christians sin a lot, we need a constant reminder of Christ's sacrifice, the price that he paid for our redemption. But as he started to explain it to her, he thought that he would kind of make it a little more personal. So instead of saying because Christians sin a lot, we need a reminder uh, he said, because I sin a lot, I need that constant reminder of Christ's sacrifice for me. The next Sunday, Rick said he overheard her talking to another person, and she said, the reason we take communion so often here is because Pastor Rick sins so much. <laughs> Man, I can relate to that, can't you? I don't know how messed up you are, but I know how messed up I am. And we talk a lot about grace here, and we take communion every week here because I'm a sinner who constantly needs to be reminded of what Christ has done. I'm guessing you do too. God uses our sinful nature, our sinful failures to make us better. The, the guilt drives us to our knees, and it motivates us to want to change. I read a book by Paul David Tripp called Whiter Than Snow. And he wrote a prayer in that book. I want to share it with you. If you want to close your eyes, you can. But this is what he wrote. In the pain of my confession, O oh God, it's hard to remember the fleeting pleasures of my sin. My shame hides your face. My anguish drowns out your voice. The lingering visions of what I've done haunt my soul. I want to undo what I've done. I want to turn back time so that my thoughts would be pure and my hands would be clean. But I cannot undo what that dark pleasure 
has wrought. And so I come to you just as I am. I bow before you ashamed and unclean. The searching light of your righteousness reveals more stains than I ever thought I had. I bow before you because there's nowhere else to go. I confess to you because there is no other hope. No place to to run, no place to hide. I cannot escape what I've done. I cannot erase my stains. So in my grief, I ask you for one thing. I long for your healing touch. I long to see you rejoice over me again. For when I have repented and I'm blessed by your gladness and the angels rejoice, then I can be sure that I have been given the greatest of gifts, the miracle of miracles, the thing that only love could purchase, forgiveness. Remember what it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I think we often go to one of two extremes when it comes to guilt and sin. Some people kind of downplay their their sin and they act like it's no big deal. I'm okay, you're okay, isn't God's grace wonderful? But then other people kind of swing the pendulum the other way and they just kind of live with this dark cloud over them and they can't let go of the past and all they can remember is all their mistakes and all their failures. In another one of Ken Geyer's books, he wrote, guilt says I screwed up. Shame says, I'm a screw-up. God uses guilt to lead us to repentance. Satan uses shame to lead us to despair. Friends, listen, we all screw up, right? The Bible makes that very clear. But God says, you are not a screw-up. God is not furious with you. He's not sick of you, and he's not ashamed of you. You are his masterpiece. He wants to purify you. He wants to sanctify you. He wants to reduce you to perfection. And so he chips away in you and me everything that's not Jesus. And it's a lifelong process, but it's an essential one. He uses his word. He uses people. He uses circumstances. He uses failure. But he wants to see Jesus in us and only Jesus. And so nothing matters more than this process. Now, before we close, and we're getting ready to, I I just want to say this one thing. I I love this analogy of God sculpting us like Michelangelo carving the Pieta. I think it's a beautiful picture of what God is up to in our lives. But there's there's a flaw in this analogy. There's kind of a breakdown in this imagery. Marble is passive, right? The sculptor exerts all the influence. Oh, the marble might prove to be hard to work with, but the the marble doesn't willfully rebel against the artist. The stone doesn't say, I'm not in the mood to be uh, carved today. I think I'm going to stay in bed. That just doesn't happen. The artist maintains control. But by very definition, on the other hand, we, we are not passive creatures. God gave us free will. We can decide to submit to what God is up to in our lives or to rebel against it. Again, from C.S. Lewis, he said, there will be two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, your will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, no, your will be done. We either choose to submit to God's chisel or we don't. He will not force himself on us. He's not going to hide in the bushes and pounce. And so the question is, are we willing stones are we eager for the chisel and hammer of the sculptor or do we stubbornly resist God's work in our lives the tools are there he's eager to use them but we have to welcome his craftsmanship listen to these verses again and I'm going to personalize them a little bit for each one of us if I am in Christ I am a new creation The old has gone, the new has come. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify me through and through. May my whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we are God's masterpiece. Christ lives in us. We're being sanctified 
through and through. He reduces us to perfection. He chips away everything in us that is not Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your work in our lives. That you don't just save us, as incredible as that process is. But you work on us. You work in us. You you work to transform us. We are being sanctified day by day, through and through, changed into the image of Christ. And God, we know that that's a lifelong process. It's not an overnight thing. But some of us would have to confess that we look back over our lives. We've been a Christian a long time, but nothing much has changed. We still do our own thing. We go our own way. We make our own choices. God, help us to get rid of the old and to become new through Christ. Help us to to be a part of this transformation process that we work with you, in step with you, that you might help us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. It's a big prayer, but you are a big God. And we trust your work in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.